No matter how much the system may change or interact with other systems, so long as it remains in existence at all, quantum theory says that its observables will only change in ways that keep that equation and all such equations true. The set of all true algebraic equations among the observables of a system is called the algebra of the observables. The algebra of the observables at any one time, like this, is what specifies the system's static constitution. And the algebraic relationships between observables at different times specify the system's dynamics or laws of motion. These can usually be summarized as differential equations. In other words, algebraic relationships between observables at infinitesimally different times. So in summary, the whole constitution of a quantum system is defined by the whole algebra of its observables, including observables at different times. What about the state? To specify the state of a quantum system, you have to specify a function called the expectation value function that maps each observable, x, to a real number called its expectation value, which is written like this. The expectation value of the observable x of t, or the expectation value of x at time t. Quantum theory places certain constraints on this function, namely that the expectation value of an observable is never lower than the lowest element in its spectrum and never higher than the highest element. So the min spectrum of x hat is less than or equal to expectation value of x hat is less than or equal to max spectrum of x hat. And the other condition is that it has to be a linear function. So the expectation value of lambda x hat plus mu y hat, say, equals lambda times the expectation value of x hat plus mu times the expectation value of y hat. I'll give an example of an expectation value function in a moment. But first, let me give an indication of what expectation values mean. If you do an experiment, you're doing it in a range of universes. You and the system and the measuring instrument are all multiversal objects. In general, all the outcomes in the spectrum of X actually occur in different universes. Therefore, it is in general impossible to predict a specific outcome for a measurement. That's where expectation values come in. They are what quantum theory makes predictions about. For instance, suppose you perform the same experiment repeatedly. What's meant by the same experiment? Well, you keep preparing the system in the same way again and again, and on each occasion, you measure x at a time t later. Then the average of all the outcomes of all those measurements tends towards the expectation value of x of t. In the limit of an infinite sequence of preparations and measurements, the average outcome would be exactly the expectation value of x of t. That's one rough and ready operational meaning of the expectation value. Another rough and ready operational meaning is this. Suppose you make many copies of the system and prepare them all in identical ways and then measure x and its counterparts in the copies. Then the average outcome tends to the expectation value of x as the number of copies tends to infinity. These meanings 
cease to be operational meanings as soon as you insert the qualification infinitely. But they cease to be strictly true if you leave it out. Well, the real meaning of the expectation value is that it's the average value of x over a region of the multiverse, the region where the system is prepared and measured in the given way. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In due course, I'll explain what a region of the multiverse is and how one averages over it and how that relates to these more operational meanings of the expectation value of an observable. Historically, the first formulation of what we would today call quantum theory was proposed by Werner Heisenberg with the help of Max Born and Pasquale Jordan in 1925. It was called matrix mechanics because in it, each observable is represented by a Hermitian matrix. And check the accompanying notes if you want a summary of the basic properties of Hermitian matrices. The eigenvalues of the matrix, which are real numbers, constitute the spectrum of the observable represented by the matrix. We're going to be using a lot of matrices, but it's important to keep at the back of your mind that it's not the matrices, but the algebra of the matrices, the algebra of the observables, that defines a physical system. If we found any set of matrices that satisfy the same algebraic relationships as the observables of a given physical system, then those matrices would do as a description of the constitution of the system. So there's a lot of freedom to choose quite different sets of matrices to describe the same physical system. One constraint is that all the matrices representing observables of a given system must have the same dimension. Otherwise, we couldn't add and subtract them and do arithmetic with them, as I've described. For each physical system, there's a minimum dimension of matrix required. And that's determined by the largest spectrum that any well, whose spectrum has n elements, then the matrix representing that observable has n different eigenvalues. So it must be at least an n by n matrix. Furthermore, not only is every observable of the system represented by an n by n Hermitian matrix, every such matrix represents an observable of the system. So that's how quantum theory describes the world. Now, what is the simplest possible quantum physical system? In classical computation, the simplest possible memory location is one that can hold either one of exactly two values. That's called a bit. Considered as a variable, a bit is called something like a degree of freedom that has only two possible values though such things don't fit comfortably into the scheme of classical dynamics, which is based on continuously varying degrees of freedom. The simplest possible quantum observable is a Boolean observable, defined as an observable with exactly two eigenvalues. Any observable simpler than that, having only one eigenvalue, would be trivial. It would be a multiple of the unit observable. Every physical system has Boolean observables. For instance, whether theta is less than 90 degrees or greater than or equal to 90 degrees is a Boolean observable. It's the observable floor of theta of t over 90, whose eigenvalue 0 stands for less than 90 and 1 stands for greater than or equal to 90. The fact that an observable has exactly two eigenvalues is physically much more significant than what those eigenvalues actually are. Remember that the eigenvalues are just labels for possible outcomes of measurements. And we can always relabel those. So for any observable, say x, with eigenvalues a and b, 
there exists another observable of the form alpha x hat plus beta 1 hat that has any other two eigenvalues we like. And measuring that observable isn't going to be much different from measuring x. So consider any physical system, let's say S. And let's choose a Boolean observable of S, call it Z hat of T, that has eigenvalues plus or minus 1. That turns out to be slightly more elegant for our purposes than choosing 1 and 0. Now, measuring Z of T has only those two possible outcomes. We could measure it by first measuring some more complicated observable of S and then evaluating some function of the outcome that ranges over plus and minus 1. But usually there are easier and more direct ways of measuring Z which involve ignoring most of S. In other words, we need only interact with the subsystem of S, in which case Z of T is also an observable of that subsystem. How simple could that subsystem be? In other words, what's the simplest kind of physical system that could hold one bit of information? Well, if Z of T is represented by a certain matrix, it has to be at least a 2 by 2 matrix because it must have exactly two eigenvalues. Then, as I've said, every other Hermitian matrix of the same dimension also represents an observable of the same system. So we know that any physical system that has Z of T as an observable also has a whole continuum of other observables, one for every 2 by 2 Hermitian matrix. And that's the minimum set of observables that a physical system can have. Every 2 by 2 matrix has either one or two distinct eigenvalues. And therefore, every observable of this minimal type of physical system is either a Boolean observable or a multiple of the unit observable. A physical system with that property, that every one of its non-trivial observables is a Boolean observable, is called a qubit. Bear in mind the difference between a qubit, a Boolean observable, and a bit. A bit is a degree of freedom that can take one of two possible values. A Boolean observable is the quantum generalization of that. In any one universe, it resembles a bit, but it can take two different values simultaneously in different universes. A qubit is a physical system a minimal physical system that contains Boolean observables. And I'll describe several such systems in future lectures. Now, consider a qubit at a given time, say, t equals zero. We won't consider other times, so I can drop the t. This qubit will have many Boolean observables. Let's pick one that has eigenvalues plus and minus 1, and is represented by a diagonal matrix. Let's call that observable Z. Now, I'll define a state that this qubit could be in during some experiment. To do that, remember, I have to specify a function on the set of all its observables, which means on all 2 by 2 Hermitian matrices. And this is the function I'll specify. The expectation value of A, B, B star, C equals just A. In other words, the expectation value of any observable is the top left element of the matrix representing that observable in this state that I've defined. 
If you look at the worked examples for this lecture, you can verify that this function has 